when I was in theatre having my surgery at 13, I woke up. He said that the condition wouldn't kill me, but it would give me a miserable life. Nobody could really help me with any of my symptoms. And that's when I found out about omega-3. I did his protocol and his protocol is 27 omega-3 tablets. And we all know how big those tablets are. For a full week, he came straight back to me and told me to do it for two weeks because of my conditions. I've got a very special guest with me here today. We met at the UK Carnival Conference and her story just blew me away, honestly. We're going to be touching on some sensitive issues and with the platform and policy and things like that, we have to be careful about how we phrase certain things. And so, Heather, welcome. Thank you, Lee, for having me. Absolutely. Um, yeah, your story was just so profound to me and perhaps even more so your your ability to overcome a lot of your issues and the, the protocols that you found out I found fascinating. And I think that my audience will benefit greatly just to, to listen. And so without further ado, I'll be all ears. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so again, I'm Heather, Heather Foley, and I'm a physiotherapist that lives in the north of Scotland. I also teach yoga and I, I teach Ashtanga and Vinyasa flow yoga. And I'm also now a holistic therapist. I've done my keto genic diet with mental health training with Dr. Georgia Eid, and I'm currently doing my nutrition network medical pathway training uh, through Professor Tim Noakes. So my background, when I was doing my physio degree in 2002, I was um, very unfortunate within the first few months of getting to the university, I was um, raped and went through a very successful court case. Um, but much to my surprise, straight after the court case, I had 10 years of PTSD which made me hyper anxious, very, very stressed. I was very nervous around people. My anxiety was through the roof. So reactive, I actually had to leave the city and the university transferred me to another university. The support I got was phenomenal, but I couldn't handle being in the city. So one of my friends pointed out to me uh, at the three year mark after it happened that it was the first time she'd received a hug from me. So I'd never even been able to hug in those three years. I was that nervous. So that was a, a huge, significant part of why I've gotten to where I've gotten to with this diet. But going back to the very beginning, as a kid, within a few days of being born, I had chicken pox. And then around the age of four or five, I had my tonsils removed. But 13, I had my appendix and cysts on my ovaries removed. Now, the appendix and the tonsils, we know, are part of the immune system. So having them taken out so young definitely compromised my health. But also, and I didn't realize this, so I suffered PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, from what I've just explained. But also, when I was in theater having my surgery at 13, I woke up while they were still doing the surgery. And all I saw were the bright lights. And they say you see bright lights when you're uh, when you've passed. So that terrified me. And then the worst pain I've ever experienced was when they lifted me from the theater table to the trolley, from the trolley to the bed. It turns out years and years later, it was explained to me that that's a severe um, PTSD again. So I'd already had PTSD in my system before I even went through what I went through in uh, my physio degree. So I dealt with that. I suffered 10 concussions between the age of about 14 and 33, predominantly through horse riding, um, but some very nasty. The last three were particularly bad and they caused me to take days to get past. And I don't know whether it's because of them or because of another condition I have that I will talk about. My balance became a big issue. And I um, used to get an awful lot of headaches. I've had migraines. I've had three MRI scans and nothing over the years and nothing was proven. So, yes, the concussions definitely didn't help me. At the age of 16 and again at 30, I suffered with Bell's palsy on the same side of my face, the left side of my face. So you'll probably notice if I'm getting tired, I'll close my left eye to focus. Um, I've had trigeminal neuralgia twice. The first one was last May and the second one was this week which is really interesting, um, which shows that I'm still under quite a bit of stress right now. Both the Bell's palsy and the trigeminal neuralgia are linked to a nerve in this area, part of the um, cranial nerves, and they affect the Bell's palsy causes one side of your face exactly to go numb. And the first time I realized it was um, when I was in boarding school and I had to frown when I saw the neurologist and I couldn't get over the fact that half my face frowned and the other didn't. That was fascinating. So the second time I got it, I knew I had it straight away because I went straight to the mirror and saw that I couldn't frown on the left side. But the trigeminal neuralgia is a tough one because it's basically electric shocks um, for me. And it goes from anywhere from your ear to your forehead, your um, cheekbone or your jawbone. Uh, and the last few days it's been in my eye socket on my left. It's been um, along my uh, cheekbone and along my jawbone. And what it feels like is all your teeth at the bottom, for example, yesterday felt like they were falling out. 
It's the only way I can describe it. And the pain is really intense, but it only lasts a few minutes and then it disappears and it can be gone for hours or a day or two. I have been told that it's not curable. It's linked to stress and you manage your stress and it will come back as and when it feels like it. So that's been very interesting. I've also, as I said, diagnosed with PCOS uh, when I was 13, 14 years old, and also a bicorneate uterus in the last 10, 15 years, which again means my uterus is split. So if I were to get pregnant, there's a very high chance I'd miscarry at week 21 because the placenta would fall away from the wall lining. Uh, so again, quite negative <laughs> input. And then the final two things I was diagnosed with was one was breathing passion disorder because of all the stress I've dealt with in my life. I was told that's why my breathing's not so great. And secondly, it was alos danlos syndrome, the hypermobile form. So I'm very hypermobile. I've only ever dislocated my elbow. Otherwise, I've just, my joints move too much. So running's uncomfortable for me. And I have confirmed arthritis in my shoulders, my right thumb, my right big toe and the middle of my back. The other thing I didn't realize about ehlers danlos syndrome, and when I did get diagnosed, it was such a eureka moment, is one, the um, arthritis was linked to it. But also, I'm highly sensitive to light, touch, sound, and smell. If I touch something and I don't like it, my brain freaks straight away and I pull my hand away. So that was really interesting. But it also um, causes me to have POTS, which is postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, which is supposedly, I've been told, I've got the blood pressure of an eight-year-old. Right. So I would lose my balance very easy. So if I went down to the bottom shelf in a shop, I'd have to have my legs wide apart and stand back up and just stand for a few seconds because I'd see stars. Uh, and again, this is all linked to this condition, which was great in a way because it made me realize it wasn't all in my head. I finally had a diagnosis and it was such a nice feeling to know, actually, you're OK. You now have a name to it and you just have to deal with it. But what I found particularly tough, nobody could really help me with any of my symptoms. It was very much we can put you on prednisolone for um, the ehlers danlos syndrome because of the pain but there's nothing we can do. But the, the worst comment I've ever had made to me was by the rheumatological consultant. He said that the condition wouldn't kill me, but it would give me a miserable life. Yeah. Now, fortunately for me, nobody tells me what I can and can't do. So that was like a red rag to a bull. Uh, and I decided to start researching it myself. And that's when I found out about omega-3. And I think a lot of people now associate me with omega-3 tablets. I came across a gentleman called Dr. Michael Lewis, uh, based in America. He's a military doctor and retired and specialized now in concussions. And he speaks at length about omega-3 and how important it is for any kind of brain injury. And I did his protocol and his protocol is 27 omega-3 tablets. And we all know how big those tablets are yeah. for a full week. But I contacted him direct and he, bless him, he came straight back to me and told me to do it for two weeks because of my conditions. And I did it for two weeks and then you drop by half every week until you get to four a day. Um, and what I found amazing, within the two weeks, I calmed right down. My stress seemed to drop. My anxiety was drastically reduced. And a few of my closest friends commented before I picked up on it that I'm much calmer in comparison to what they're used to, which is, is quite interesting when you think you're quite calm anyway. But in reality, in hindsight, you realize you're quite a hyper person. So that was really interesting. That was the start of my journey. And that was back in 2010. Uh, and around the same time, I found the uh, first Do No Harm movie with Meryl Streep, um, which is about epilepsy. And I think everyone should watch that movie. But basically, long story short, it's about a young boy who has epilepsy and he comes across the ketogenic diet. His parents come across the ketogenic diet and they find that it actually helps. So I researched said ketogenic diet and I found that it's been around since 1921. And it's the most researched diet in the world. And my thought passion was, if it can help epilepsy, it has to help 10 concussions and PTSD. So I went straight in. And within a few weeks, again, I felt absolutely amazing. Everything seemed to settle. The pains weren't as bad. And I just felt, in general, I was feeling much better myself. But over time, I realized that I um, was very good at overeating. Because on a ketogenic diet, there's certain foods that you can definitely overeat on. And the problem for me, and the reason I went um, carnivore way of eating in 2018, May 2018, was I was sitting at work and I ate either 500 grams or a kilo of macadamia nuts. And my reasoning was they were high fat, so they were okay. But I was so shocked that they were that moorish that I had to eat them all. Right. That was the day I stopped the ketogenic diet and went straight into the carnivore. Uh, and I ate two ribeye steaks per meal with butter uh, every single day for months. 
So it, the transition from quiche to carnivore was the addictions were stopping me being able to enjoy quiche anymore. So and my symptoms were good, but they weren't perfect. And that's what I realized when I went carnivore. But one thing I have forgotten is um, when I saw the cardiologist who diagnosed me with POTS, he asked me to put salt in my water, which I found really intriguing because usually heart specialists tell you that you should stay away from salt. But it turns out when you put salt in your water, um, it can be really beneficial to balance. Mm -hmm. And that helped my balance settle down. And I noticed that now, because I've been carnivore as long as I have, I rarely take salt. If my balance becomes a problem or if I get headachey, I will add salt to my water again. But if I'm fine, I have no desire to have it at all. So apologies, I missed that one out. Interesting. Um, oh, absolutely. So the carnivore, I did went all out on the in May 2018. Uh, first off, I lost my period for three three months, mm. which I wasn't overly concerned about because I knew I wasn't pregnant. So I just kept with it to see what happened, and I wasn't underweight. Um, and after three months, it came back. Now, bearing in mind, I have PCOS. So which means you can have very irregular periods. So I would have the longest period I remember was seven weeks. Um, and other than that, I'd have two weeks on, a week off and two weeks on. Mm. They're all over the place. But when I got my period back, they are literally four days on. And the whole cycle is 26 to 28 days. And mm. that's been six and a half years. Wow. I just that's the biggest achievement out of everything I've done with this way of eating, which makes me think hopefully the PCOS has settled. Yeah. So went on the carnivore way of eating and I ate methodically ribeye steaks and butter for months and months and months. Gosh, an awful lot better. Felt amazing. And around Christmas time, I decided to have a bit of dark chocolate because everyone on the carnivore diet, it's a contentious subject, but coffee and dark chocolate seemed to somehow wriggle in. And I went out of my way to justify this dark chocolate by finding a Facebook group, <laughs> a carnivore Facebook group that allowed dark chocolate. Yeah. And it, like, that just shows what my addictions are like. Absolutely fine if I eat meat, but add in anything that's, oh, why not give it a try? So that became a big thing for me that I realized that I'm very prone to addiction. Um, once I start, I can't stop and I can go months and months of eating dark chocolate. And then I have to somehow get myself off it. And as Dr. Georgie Eats says, a tr true addict will disappear for up to six months while they try and battle their demons to get off that said addiction. And I know exactly how that feels. So over time, I've tweaked my diet constantly because what I found is people were getting better and all their symptoms were going away just like that. Mm. What I found is I went from keto to carnivore and now I've gone into ketovore. And for me, ketovore is not a vegetables, green vegetables and avocados and olives, etc. It is a high fat meat diet. So I eat higher fat um pieces of meat like ribeyes. Um, I eat uh, bone marrow, um, pemmican, suet. I, I add a lot of fat to everything I eat and um, cod livers and cod liver oil. I tend mm. to eat quite a lot of fish. So all of that um, has really, really helped me to get rid of my addictions. But because I'm big into keto and I've done my ketogenic training with Dr. Eid, I'm very big on my levels of the ketogenic diet. So what I've realized over time is if I sit around three millimoles of ketones and about 3.5 four of glucose, then I have no addictions whatsoever. My stress levels are really, really good and I cope much better in life. Mm -hmm. So everybody thinks the carnivore way of eating is just eat the meat or eat butter and meat and et cetera, et cetera, as long as it's from the animal kingdom. And I know from trial and error for six and a half years, I know exactly what works for me. And I think that's where my story is very different to people. I'm very high fat in my way of eating. Yeah. Yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah, it's a lot to say, it's but amazing. I hope that covers most of it. Yeah, I suppose we've got these carnivore diets, and they're not necessarily sort of ketogenic diets because they're they're often kicking that individual out of ketosis when they're sitting down and eating a big bolus of protein. Yeah, um, and you know that's very different. You kind of have to manage that level, and mm. and would you say you're kind of always low grade ketosis? Well, that's it. Because when I started first, I could have two ribeye steaks a day, and that's yeah. like my body was saying, "Feed me, keep the protein coming. I need the protein." But over time, my, um, I started to get really tired and really irritable when I had my two steaks. And that's when I decided to start checking my ketones to see what was going on but for an hour after eating and two hours after eating. And I was constantly out of ketosis. So then I realized I can only have one steak per meal with fat and I'm fine. I, so I can have three steaks in the day now, um, but they have to be one meal at a time. Uh, I prefer to eat twice a day 
but it's literally just one steak at a time. And I will sit, stay in ketosis. But what I was doing, like you just said, is I was in a place called no man's land. So mm -hmm. I was never fully in ketosis and I've never fully out of it. I was going back and forward. So I'm never gaining the full benefits of a ketogenic diet. Yeah, because it's very therapeutic when we stay in that ketosis state or high ketosis state, <laughs> I suppose. But, um, that's the point. So a nutritional ketosis is 0.5 millimoles to uh, 2.53 millimoles. But if you've had any kind of traumatic brain injuries, as I have, or cancer or um, autoimmune conditions, you want to be sitting around three to five millimoles. And that's called therapeutic. So it is higher than the average person, yes. but you need it. And and if I if I'm really struggling, I will force myself to get right up there and sit in three to four consistently. And and then I'm I'm monitoring it all the time now to see what the pattern's like and what's causing me to um, fall out of ketosis. Yeah, I was wondering if you could get into a little bit more detail with the protocol. Um, is it Michael Lewis? Yes, Dr. Dr. Michael Lewis. Lewis. Yeah. Just in terms of like the specifics, if somebody was interested, they've they've heard what you've, you've just talked about there and thought, wow, that's that's amazing. Maybe that's something that I should look into. How would yes. you sort of coach that individual in terms of where to look for a certain product, storage, how much the pro you know, any kind of um, problems that may come with that? Yeah, really, really good point there, actually. I'm glad you mentioned this. So first off, Dr. Michael Lewis has his own website. Um, I can give you the link to put up later, but he has a protocol. And if, if you put in Dr. Michael Lewis Omega-3 protocol, you'll find exactly what I did. But I contacted him to get more information relative to my symptoms. His argument, and I know other people will contend this, Omega-3 has to stay in the fridge because in general it goes rancid if it's not in, left in the fridge. I know that most um, companies will not sell their stuff through Holland and Barrett, for example, because they won't keep their stuff in the fridge. So in order to get good quality Omega-3, you need to go to good companies. So the company I specifically use are Nordic Naturals Omega-3, and they use sardines and anchovies to get their Omega-3, whereas others use the dregs of the fish to get Omega-3, which is not as beneficial. Okay. And is that specifically DHA with a little bit of EPA or? No, so, so it, no, uh, so omega-3 is DHA and EPA. There's more EPA naturally in it than DHA. EPA right. is more for the nerve, so it'll help with your nerves, um, but DHA specifically for your brain. Um, but they come as, as a um, team um, and there's more EPA in general Got whenever it. you get them than there is DHA. Interesting. Okay. I suppose, could you maybe take us through a typical day of eating just to share what that looks like? Yeah, so talking about the fact that I have trigeminal neuralgia this week, Wednesday I was really bad and Thursday it went away and yesterday I came back and this morning it was a bit bad. So right now I can't bring myself to eat any red meat and ribeyes, as I said earlier, literally have always been my staple diet for six and a half years. So today I've had salmon, trout and prawns. That's my lunch. And for breakfast I had sardines and cod liver's pate. And um, what I do is I have um, sardines from Tesco's in spring water. I put four cans of sardines into a blender with two tins of cod livers in cod liver oil from, I believe it's Icon Icelandic. I get them from on Amazon. And I basically blend that lot together um, and I eat that. I believe right now the reason I can't stomach the meat is because I'm desperately trying to keep my brain calm instinctively. So I'm looking for as much fish as I can get. And it is the only thing I fancy at the moment. So and I don't tend to eat after two o'clock. Right. Oh, OK. Yeah, that, I, I quite like to finish early as well. I find it affects my sleep and even getting up to urinate. <laughs> things yeah. like that, I find that, that that factors in with maybe less for you because you probably you're eating less protein, maybe. Well, no, it's interesting you say that. And that's a really good point. And I spoke about this in my presentation. I use an aura ring and I have a snore app um, because it was highlighted to me once, just once <laughs> that I tend <laughs> to snore. And it turns out that I snore if I eat a meal in the evening so anything after two o'clock and I will naturally snore at night if I don't eat before two o'clock I never snore at night which I found fascinating yeah and with my aura ring my body temperature goes um higher my heart rate goes through the roof and my uh, deep sleep goes down as much as to three minutes and you're supposed right. to average an hour and a half a night that's just from eating late and when I say late it's any time after two o'clock so again it's the whole as an individual how does it affect you yeah. Most people listening to this probably would have no problem with doing that. But for me, I've worked out through years of trial and error that actually I cannot eat late in the evening. And if I were to, if I was to go out for a meal, uh, I wouldn't eat for 24 hours. Um, the other thing I meant, forgot to mention is I dry fast. I've been dry fasting for yeah. six years. And prior to that, I was water fasting for about six years. So I do a lot of little hacks to help yeah. myself. But exactly like you, I don't sleep efficiently if I... Um, 
if I eat late in the day. So fascinating. I, I was always just under the impression, you know, if I can get my meal in before it gets dark, that kind of thing, because I think that plays around with hormones as well. And I think there's mm. a lot to that. Um, so I, I actually get away with eating a little bit later than than you, but for sort of a different reason, I suppose. But no, it's amazing. Obviously, your brain's like it knows exactly what it wants and what it doesn't want. And you've finally found what it is that works. And you kind of have to be very strict about keeping to that just to function. Is that fair to say? A hundred percent. And it's as I said before, it was so frustrating that everyone was just getting better and feeling amazing. Mm -hmm. And I just had to tweak and tweak and tweak. And now I know. And I teach people. I have a um, what do one-to-ones and I have a um, Zoom group. It's amazing how we all have different ways of doing things and what foods work for us. Like we were talking earlier, I, I can't eat eggs, like BBE. I, I don't do well with butter or eggs. And it took me a long time to work that out, whereas I thought it was fine. But again, through trial and error, I realized that red meat, like fat, bacon fat. I don't know if people in here know about PKD, paleo, um, ketogenic diet with Dr. Sophia Clemens. She rates bacon fat, uh, specifically mangalitsa pig fat. I have sat and ate up to a kilo or 500 grams within 24 hours. Wow. Because the ratio of fat to salt for me is obviously highly addictive. So I can't touch that stuff because my whole, my hands swell up, my feet swell up. I feel dreadfully uncomfortable. So again, it's it's working out what works for you. So just because people say it's good for you yeah. doesn't necessarily mean it is. Because even, yeah, because I mean, the amount of times that we're, we're told to eat intuitively, you go on this diet, your hormones are going to function right. And I even say a lot of the same things. And I think that it's true. But to be more specific, you know, for some people, they may be able to chow down on the bacon, but that might not be doing them any favors. And they might yeah. want to eat more fish, for example, or less eggs and things like that. So, yeah, I mean, if you think about myself, when I went beef, butter, bacon and eggs, it only took three weeks and I was kind of like, I feel fantastic. And maybe that annoys a lot of people if they've tried to do the same and think, thought, well, you know, why is it not working for me? And they mm -hmm. may give up and they may think, well, that's it. Maybe I need to try a completely different diet, but perhaps it's, we're on that spectrum of a proper human diet, but it, it may look very different. Like your diet looks totally different from mine. You know, the, the amount of meals, when you, you think about starting to eat your first meal and finishing for the day, there's so many nuances, um, salt intake, how much water. Yeah. Um, it just goes on and on and on, doesn't it? And, and again, because some people can take lots and lots of salt. My, my body, like, I, am, I don't know if this is too much information for this crowd, but I eat liver raw. Yeah. And I love my liver raw. And I've done it for quite a few years. I'll freeze it for two weeks and then I'll take it out. And I'm very lucky. My butcher gives me the leftover liver that's not aesthetically pleasing. They've normally been. So I get all this free liver. But I really enjoy it raw. And the, the really interesting thing is as soon as my body rejects it, that's when I realize that I no longer need whatever is in that liver. Yeah. So going back to the intuitive, there's certain things my body desperately wants. And then when it doesn't, it lets me know. And one of them is also salt. If I over consume salt, my hands start to swell up mm. every single yeah. time. Whereas when I need it, nothing, I don't have any issues at all. Yeah, I found some interesting things with salt as well. In the beginning, obviously, when I came out of surgery, it was like lots of emphasis on you need to really be mindful of you getting enough salt because you don't have a colon. You're not going to reabsorb this water and the sodium, mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, and I went carnivore and I think most people would think, whoa, that's a lot of salt that you're using there. Interestingly, these days, I pretty much add the salt, cook the meat, and I don't require any more salt. My body doesn't want any more salt. I was getting up in the morning and putting a little you know, shot of salt in my mouth. And now it's just like almost repulsive. And mm -hmm. so I just don't do that anymore. That's the other thing. I don't know if you've heard of Charles Washington or um, Dana Spencer or Kelly. Well, everyone knows Kelly Hogan, I think yeah. now. But these people are really long term in this way of eating like 20 mm -hmm. plus years. And they don't do salt. Yeah. And, and some of them did to taste and then they no longer need it. So you don't necessarily need salt. So this thing of like the lion's eye, you have to have um, beef or lamb, salt and water. So well, you don't necessarily need the salt. You'll get to a stage where you just listen to your body and don't go, well, I've been told to take it. So I need to keep taking. So no, no, no. If your body's saying no, acknowledge it. And then if you feel that desire to have salt, add a tiny bit to your water and see if it makes a difference. Yeah, I agree. I think obviously you'd have to add it first and your body will let you know. Most yeah. likely in the beginning, you're going to use that and it's going to be very beneficial. Might keep carb cravings away and cramps yeah. and it's all that kind of stuff. But once your body then adjusts, because that takes a long time, sometimes okay. for a lot of people, a long, long time to adjust. And then all of a sudden it's like, wait a minute, I don't want to eat so much protein. or I don't really fancy the salt anymore. It's kind of tasting a bit strange. And I think the body's very reliable in those contexts where it's like, mm -hmm. please don't, no more. You know, it's kind of like that's usually very reliable, isn't it? And that's that's something, again, I said at the presentation, I spoke about um, how embarrassed I was in a situation I was in a good few years ago. There was a parent from a physio perspective that I was treating, and she told me about her daughter who um, was born by four steps and had a traumatic brain injury as a result, mm -hmm. and um, that she was quite slow and had difficulties at school, etc. 
And I spoke to her about the ketogenic diet and asked her would she be open to it. And she asked me what foods they were. And I said like um, butter, cheese, fish, um, olives and eggs. And she was really shocked when I said that. And it turns out the reason she was really shocked was because that's every food her daughter eats naturally right. craves. And I remember thinking it's taken me how many years to get back to what we instinctively naturally would have done as a kid. Yeah. So I've messed up my diet so much. My brain doesn't intuitively know how to go. You need this. You don't need this. Whereas this little four year old, if you gave her the eggs, she'd devour them. Yeah. And we've no idea that the reason she's devouring them is because she knows her brain needs them on that instinctive level. Yeah, that's a really important point, and I can agree more with that, definitely. Perhaps you can get into some of the uh, lifestyle applications that you find really help, because diet isn't the be-all and end-all. I think there's a lot of other things, other practices and applications that we can use that, that can be really helpful. Well, I know that I'm really grateful that I found the carnivore way of eating, and that I've found that ketovore works incredibly well for me, and I'm very, very grateful for that. But I'm also acutely aware I need other tools, and my probably number one for me is walking. Um, if I'm stressed, I walk and I'll walk on my own and I'll just keep walking. I can walk for hours and, and I just, it calms me right down, which helps. Another one of my favorite goes to uh, our gratitude. I always have, after being graped, I prioritized uh, gratitude and I went through a phase where I really, really struggled to get out of bed um, and I wouldn't get out until I said 20 things I was grateful for. Mm -hmm. To really understand that I'm incredibly lucky and yes, it was unfortunate that it happened but I have other things to be grateful for so to this day I still use it I used it when I worked in the military as a physio I use it in my yoga classes I'm, I'm a big advocate of gratitude because we just forget sometimes how lucky we are another one is um circadian rhythm I have um iris on my computer so the computer screen changes with the day and the light outside I have blue blocking glasses so I have yellow during the day when I worked in HS I really needed that I have orange for the afternoon evening and I have red for nighttime. Um, and that's more so in the winter. I also like to always have windows open so the light is naturally coming in. Because I, And I'm very fortunate I live by the sea and I have three lovely beaches to walk on. So I walk barefoot at the beach and essentially just try and stay as close to nature. One thing I'm really fortunate about is I can get all my food within a 25 mile radius. And there's a guy called Dr. Jack Cruz and he talks at length about the fact that if you use the food that comes local to you, that food gets the same light that you get. Yeah. which means it's very compatible when you digest it. And to me, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm definitely big on that. So I get fish locally. There's two fishmongers that pass my door, uh, fortunately. So I get that locally and I get the meat within a 25 mile radius. Uh, so that helps a lot. And even if you ate vegetables and fruit, again, just keep them within that 25 mile radius, I think. Cold water therapy is another one. A few years ago, if you told me I would be doing cold water therapy, I would have laughed at you. But actually, I find it's really good for mindfulness. So I try and um, just run a cold bath at night time and just lie there or I go to the sea at least once a week. I was supposed to go usually on Monday, but last week we went on a Wednesday and I'm really relieved because there was three basking shark going up and down where we swim on the uh, Monday. So I'm very glad we went on the Wednesday instead. Mm -hmm. Seemingly there was an orca as well, which I didn't see. Oh, wow. um, yeah, very lucky where we live. And what else? So yeah, meditation, uh, emotional freedom technique, breath work mm -hmm. through Patrick McHugh and Oxygen Advantage. Uh, and yoga and I've and Reiki is another one and I qualified in all of those for me to help me understand them but now I actually use them with my clients relative to who needs them right. uh, when I was told about the breathing pattern disorder what I didn't realize is that you have to learn to breathe through your nose only we're not designed to breathe through our mouth if you are interested in all of that look into James Nestor or Patrick McEwen um, they've had many podcasts and fascinating to listen to so they're all the little hacks that I have for me to make sure that I keep myself settled. And I have to say, if I sit around for a day doing nothing, it does me no favours. I have to walk. I have to be in the fresh air. Yeah, I'm, I'm similar in terms of like routine is so important for me. And I know it can be easy to fall out of routine. It seems harder sometimes to you know get up and see the sunrise or take that walk and yeah. run yourself a cold bath. But when you do it, you don't regret doing it. Yeah. When, you, when you don't do it, you think, oh, what have I done? Because you can't, it can mess things up. Obviously, on my channel, I speak a lot about sort of bowel movements and things like this. I was actually curious with the the extra high fat protocols. Do you find that that affects bowel movements? Because a lot of people, when they overeat fat, it's almost like their body doesn't let them actually overeat fat because then they have kind of a faster output, if you like. So again, I, I love that question because I'm unique. <laughs> I have eaten up to 5,000 calories in a day. 3,000 of that was fat. And I don't have any issues with my bowels. 
So I was asked at the conference by overdosing on, so I think it was 27 grams of omega-3. It was added up to that I was having a day. And again, didn't affect my bowels at all. So I'm of the belief that my body thrives on good fats. Yeah, 100%. Definitely, definitely. Um, is it fair to say that you, perhaps you were a little bit anxious at the moment because of the upcoming event? Is that what you got yeah. on your mind? or? Absolutely. I um, Thank you. I'm running a conference, uh, hosting a conference with my partner, uh, Ben Hunt, at the Keto Brain Health Conference in Manchester on the 19th of August. Prior to this last few weeks, I was quite the introvert. I'm not a social person. I don't have Instagram. The only Instagram I have is the Keto Brain Health Instagram um, page. So I'm really putting myself out there. I've got a worry stone that I'm constantly rubbing to keep myself calm. And uh, yeah, I'm challenging myself in a way that I never thought possible. But what I've realized is I've had quite a few people come back to me saying that they've I've helped them understand where they've been going wrong because they were listening to do this and this is all you need to do when sometimes it's not that simple. So I'm willing to put myself out there. And in um, February, my father passed away and I the week he passed away, he I was with him for five days and I was power of attorney. So I had to make the final decisions. So the, the five days before he passed away, and the three days I was still in Ireland before he was buried, I, I made the decision to stay high ketosis. Mm. And I was fishing between three and 3.5 millimoles of ketones every single day. And it was only when I came back from the funeral uh, and I spoke with Ben, um, I realized that I'd stayed really calm and composed throughout with all the decisions I had to make, with the stress of watching your father pass away, um, and he had vascular dementia, was really, really tough. But I was shocked how extraordinary the ketogenic diet really, really is when you have a strong enough why. And um, Ben basically said, you've got to, this is your vision, you've got to bring this to a conference. Um, so we decided to go ahead with it. And I reached out to the speakers we've reached out to, which are Zoe Harcombe, Ivor Cummins, uh, Dr. Rachel Brown, uh, Brown um, Richard Smith and Dr. Anthony Jaffe, and every single one of them said yes. Great. And, and that's, that's blown my mind that they're all open to helping us because specifically what we're doing, Lee, is we want this to be specifically for the layperson. There's this, the PHC do a phenomenal job of trying to bring it to the um, academics, to the NHS, to the doctors. We're trying to bring it to the layperson. I've had many people say the ketogenic diet's dangerous, it's going to kill me. I keep being told it's a fat diet, et cetera, et cetera. And I can only say so much. And that's when I thought, if I bring the experts in and people can sit and listen to these people, like I don't know if people know Zoe Harcombe. Zoe Harcombe is phenomenal when it comes to fat and was integral in Professor Tim Noakes being, um, oh, he won his court case. Uh, his yeah. trial that he had against the Dietetics Society in Africa, South Africa. It was unbelievable. If you research that, that's amazing. But this lady knows everything and she's a beautiful soul. And I just, I'm so grateful to have her there to help yeah. people understand fat is not bad for you. And, and, and the food you eat is not bad. Like cutting the fat off your steak makes no sense because it's perfectly protein to fat ratio if you keep the fat there. Yeah. Um, that kind of stuff. So, so yes, yeah, so we've got that conference. Um, looking forward to it. But again, I believe that's probably why I've got my trigeminal neuralgia back. I'm putting myself so far out of my comfort zone, I can't see where my um, safe place is anymore. Yeah. However, it's worth it. And that's why I think I'm having so much fish right now and no desire for red meat. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. It makes a lot of sense. This is how individualistic we all are. I and mean, our needs are totally unique. So yeah. Where can we find you? Because you said you have very little social media. Do you have a website or anything? My website's really simple. It's my name, www.heatherfoley.co.uk. The website for the conference is Keto Brain Health, all one word, .co.uk. And Instagram is at Keto Brain Health. Keto Excellent. Brain Health. Excellent. I will link all of that below if anybody's yeah. interested. And I will send you the link for Dr. Michael Lewis. Brilliant. Yeah, appreciate that. Well, it's been a real pleasure. Honestly, it blows me away, your story. And I Thank think there's a lot of people much. out there that will benefit just from, from hearing the way that you've gone about kind of managing the problems and resolving some of these problems. And I think in many ways, you know, we're all still learning. And for many of us, we need to actually find what works for us and stick to it because we owe that to ourselves. You know, we, we don't need to suffer in the ways that we, we think is just normal. You know, oh, I just that's just me, my genetics. Um, and and you, it's like you said earlier, it's environmental. We all mm -hmm. come from a completely different background yeah. what's your history what's your trauma how do you handle trauma in comparison to someone else there's there's so many variables it, it it's my argument would be never give up so true so true yeah. thanks so much heather thank you thank you